to the first international first Malaysia International Conference on Nanotechnology and Catalysis (MICNC) 2021. We are now in the sessions of technical talk and keynote session six. My name is Yasmin Abdul Wahab from Nanocat UM, and I will be your session chair for this afternoon. For those who intend to ask question to our honourable speakers, you can channel your question in the chat box and your question will be raised in the question banner and will be highlighted accordingly. So to start with, I am honoured to give a brief introduction of our first speaker for our technical talk, Dr. A. B. Su from High Tech Instruments and Jan Berhad. AB received her Bachelor of Engineering with Honours Degree from University of Malaya, UM, and Master of Science Degree in Materials Engineering from University of Science, Malaysia. AB continued her research at the University of Queensland, Australia, and obtained her PhD degree in Materials Engineering in 2017. She optimized the growth of different types of 3-5 nanowires using MOCVT and applied different analysis techniques in EM such as TEM, STEM, EDX, CBED, EELS as well as CS corrected stem to study the growth mechanism of those 1D nanomaterials. Between the year 2015 to 2017, she was a staff member at the Center for Microscopy and Microanalysis, CMM, University of Queensland to provide analytical TEM training for the researchers from both academic and industry. In 2018, she joined High Tech Instruments as a technical PA and application specialist to oversee various projects and provide technical solution, especially in the area of advanced imaging and characterization for the customers. So without further ado, I would like and I am honored to invite Dr. A.B. Su to share the technical talk on Hitachi HF5000 in-situ observations of catalytic catalytic particles in gas atmosphere using abrasion corrected scanning transmissions electron micros microscopy. Welcome. The stage is yours, Dr. A.B. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for the uh, introduction. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. A.B. here from High Tech Instruments. Yeah, today is my honor to share with you some of the latest technology by Hitachi, which is the uh, uh, the invention of the CS corrector uh, stem, TEM or SEM, uh, the model is HF5000 with the in-situ observation of catalytic particles in gas atmosphere using an aberration corrector scanning transmission electron microscope. So it means that this uh, stem or the TEM itself, you can do in-situ observation of your catalysis, catal uh, catalytic particles and you can inject some the gas to see the reaction of the catalyst. And a little bit of the overview of this development of next generation, 200 kV uh, fuel emission TEM. So TEM and STEM, TEM transmission electron microscope or scanning transmission electron microscope market, segments predict the largest growth in the coming years. STEM market has been growing significantly since uh, 2009, so it's almost, uh, more than 10 years now. And yeah, I know it's actually like uh, four, four or five years. And academia, researchers in the academic and semiconductor industry, uh, the requirement is that uh, to have the high resolution imaging and also to have high sensitivity, high sensitivity elemental analysis in this um, uh, fuel emission TEM or STEM. And today the uh, focus is actually on the catalyst research, such as fuel cell, is increasing uh, in demand for in-situ imaging in the gas atmosphere. So that's the outlook of the Hitachi HF5000. And yep, a little bit of that. So what is the requirements for the atomic resolution, observation, and analysis? Uh, it means that your sample you put in, not only looking at the small particle, nanoparticles, 
but you can observe the atom, atoms uh, within your sample, your particles. And we know that the atoms is actually the, the arrangement of the atom, the crystal structure is actually greatly affecting the performance of your catalyst, uh, catalyst particles. Yeah. So for functional materials development, failure analysis, and so on for the industry semiconductor, we actually require uh, for the development of the TEM stem, high stability and throughput capability is required. And high resolution and sensitivity is very important. And uh, also very uh, one thing to emphasize is that this uh, equipment is to um, allow versatile observation, such as you can ob uh, observe TEM, the stem, and also SEM in one system. And uh, there is, it comes with a CS corrector automated alignment for the usability improvement to achieve atomic resolution. And also you need to have the high stability of the electronics and mechanical of the system so that it uh, reduce or mini minimize the vibration when you capture atomic resolution imaging. And also it's uh, very important to have low specimen beam damage uh, on your sample. And ease of view is something very important for the user to, um, to, to operate this uh, uh, dedicated uh, atomic resolution stem. So with these requirements, Hitachi is actually developed the, this uh, next generation 200 kV fuel emission TEM or stem, uh, come with a high brightness code FE gun, which provides a very uh, high resolution and stability of the gun itself. And uh, it comes with a fully automatic aberration correction function developed by Hitachi and high sensitivity elemental analysis by high solid angle, uh, the SDD detector um, and simultaneous observation of the surface by the SE detector and the inner structure in a variety gas atmosphere, this one by STEM detector. And this one you can actually induce a gas. And that is the uh, uh, requirements for high resolution and sensitive analysis for wide range specimens and integrating the technologies into this model HF5000. So, it require high uh, the fuel emission transmission electron microscope, scanning transmission electron microscope, or uh, scanning electron microscope three in one in a system. It can achieve the high re resolution analytical capability in TM, STEM, and SEM. And also it comes with the design of the environmental imaging. Uh, we call it ESTEM or, or ETM or ESEM. So it, this is an in-situ lab in gap. And it's, come, uh, it's actually designed with the ease of use. And this one is actually for the uh, stability of the system itself. So a little bit of introduction is um, this one. It, it comes with the Hitachi fully automated prop-forming spherical aberration corrector for the atomic resolution imaging and it has the high brightness and stability co-FE electron gun and ultra stable column mm, and power supplies for management and it uh, can do simultaneous CS correctors SEM and stem imaging capability with atomic resolution and it has a new high stability site entry specimen stage and specimen holder is actually uh, covered by this uh, uh, box and you can have this symmetrically opposed um, dual uh, 100 mm square EDS detectors and the new design enclosure, enclosure for optimum performance in real lab uh, environments. And there is a wide range of Hitachi advanced specimen holders, different kind of specimen holders you can use in this lab in gap uh, design and lab in gap capabilities gas injection and differential pumping for environmental TEM and environmental STEM. So this is actually the similar things. And uh, the design for this, uh, to highlight that, the design of this in-situ lab in gap is uh, focused uh, on the catalyst uh, analysis experiments. So in worldwide, there's been um, uh, the model of HF5000 has been installed in different research center and also uh, industry focused on the catalyst uh, uh, activities or the their research are uh, focused on the fuel cell catalyst and there's the specification here i'll just yeah highlight it's that the tm resolution is 0 0.102 nanometer and that is the different tilting range so yep and 
this is how the auto alignment uh, Hitachi in-house CS corrector can be uh, done. So it's actually by just one click, you see that even like an atom here for this sample is a silicon sample. For without CS corrector, you only can see this one thing, but with the CS corrector uh, and with this ease of view of seeing alignment by one click, you can resolve the two atoms within one lattice. So this is how it is uh, been after correction. And this one also uh, to highlight that the fast and stable of switch between different modes. So this is the uh, control panel of the HR5000. And it, this is the stem imaging, the dark view stem imaging you, is also atomic resolution. You switch to TEM by just one click and you switch back to stem. It's a very simple clicking and switching. And this is the TEM image window. You have the image and all the operation. And this is the FFT. If let's say you have to uh, adjust the stigmatism or the lattice, you can uh, see from the FFT image, fast Fourier transform. And for this one is you can, uh, it's actually for this uh, model, you will simultaneously um, display six channel stem window. This is a SE imaging, bright field imaging, dark field imaging with their corresponding uh, FFT images. And the simultaneous uh, atomic resolution of STEM SEM imaging and movie recording is um, available for, especially when you want to see the activities of the catalyst uh, reaction when you in the lab and gap uh, setting. So uh, dark field STEM showing your Z contrast with the material contrast. So the bright one is actually showing higher atomic number and the bright field STEM itself is actually showing phase contrast. So it's all in, it's a platinum, it's a gold nanoparticles. Yeah, you can see the atom here. Even with the SE imaging, it's something very special with uh, to, to install in a TEM, the detector. It can also achieve uh, the atomic resolution SE imaging. It means that these two, you are looking into internal structure of the gold particle. This one, you're actually looking at the surface of the nanoparticles. Later, we'll have some example to explain to to the audience, like why it's important to correlate these two uh, um, image, uh, the results. And that's the detector configuration here with the CS corrector. And this is the SE or BSC detector here. So that is the corresponding uh, SE imaging. There is a catalytic particle on the support, carbon support. And this the dark field detector here. And you have the bright field detector here. Your specimen is here. So this is your core, um, the same location, you can capture the images simultaneously. So you, you see that for the same area, same uh, location, for the SE imaging and the hard diff or the ADF stem imaging, dark field imaging, you will see different information from your sample. And the next one, this one is actually, you also can do direct observation of oxygen atoms, which is something very significant is, uh, uh, to observe oxygen atoms using your bright field stem detector. Dark field stem you can't observe, but for this one, when you enlarge that, you can see the oxygen atom here. These are all atoms, yeah. And the next thing is about the EDX detector. Usually for the configuration of TEM, you only have one TEM detector, but with this design that with a high sensitivity, dual STD detector is actually uh, achievable. And with this uh, double, uh, double detector, the with uh, um, 200 mm square windows and windowless uh, SDD detector, you actually, um, it's, it's, it offers you double count rate of the, your EDX analysis or mapping. And it is less uh, specimen tilt angle sensitivity. It means that no matter how you tilt your sample, your count is always at the maximum. So this one positive tilt, uh, 10 degree, this one negative tilt. And the automated protection retract of SDD when large electron induced. Yeah, this has come in there. So this one is the one of the example of the EDS mapping at atomic resolution. So this is gallium K alpha is a gallium uh, atom here. Uh, uh, you view a long one one zero direction, and this one is arsenic, and this one is the kind of the the mapping uh, of these two. So you have the gallium atom here, the arsenic atom here. It's very um nice mapping using this uh double uh the the dual detector here. Uh, you can map even for atomic resolution. And for this one is another example of the uh, scrotum titanium oxide. So this is the uh, dark field stem. This is the acid imaging. It's a, you can see that this one showing that the, it's a, like they have the carbon on top of the sample because this one gives you the surface imaging. And you also can 
we have the atomic resolution on your SE and for your dark field stand. And that is this is the EDX atomic column mapping. So all the atom can be accurate and nicely mapped, even for the oxygen here. So yeah, that is the uh what is that the modeling for, for the strontium titanium oxide view along 100. So it match exactly with your experiment data and your theory, uh, the, uh, theoretical mo modeling. And the next one is another example for so the use. Yeah. And I would uh, go uh, like this one, introduce on the institute capability. So the, um, the previous is, the, is the, uh, all those uh, capability within the HF5000 and how this institute capability can be, in, uh, have, we can have that in the HF5000 Come in the uh, introduce a background, the institute microscope and result, and some application. So, in order to understand the reaction characteristic of catalyst, there is an increasing need for microstructure evaluation in real environments using TEM or STEM. And catalyst, which is also the particle size, has become smaller, and you realize that it really becomes smaller, smaller, which offer the excellent performance, such as metal nanoparticles, clusters, or even single atoms. An institute observation is required to have a higher higher resolution than before so for the design of this environmental stem in hf 5000 it comes with a gas injection and in envelope the sample heating using the holder and also the aberration corrector stem to achieve the atomic resolution and that is the two uh this is the traditional closed window so this is a column and usually uh the the holder is actually entrapped here to have the gas flow within the holder and this there's a membrane here you put your sample here but this whole column still within high tram, high vacuum and the pressure for this one is actually uh 10 to the power of 5 pascal based on the column tm column uh pressure and the resolution uh, uh somehow is limited due to the beam scattering of the membrane because there is membrane here so that the gas won't release to the high vacuum here to um but for with this open window in this hash of 5000 design the pressure is actually you can achieve you see that now your holder is actually no longer um limited you actually your gas directly injected into the the tm into uh stem but with this orifice here to protect the the chamber at your co-fe and the pressure here you can achieve 10 to the power of 3 pascal the resolution now you can achieve atomic level and the uh, um Advantages for this one is your S images also can be captured with the detector and you can achieve higher spatial resolution and also the EDS detection sensitivity. So this is the, the background of the design of the lab in gap in HF5000 for the catalysis uh, uh, observation. So yeah, for the open window here, so that you can see the gas system here. So this is the, the nozzle here. You can inject the gas nozzle uh, gas into using the column nozzle here onto your sample and you have this holder any holder can work now so this holder depends on what kind of experiment you want to do you insert the holder and this one is actually heating holder so the gas can be locally injected to the sample high nitrogen or air or even this kind of uh, gases depends on your experiments and the estimated pressure around the specimen is 10 10 pascal and maximum gas flow so you can adjust the gas flow here and yeah, there is a dispersion pumping aperture here. So to pump pump the 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 this this area to have a good uh, vacuum. Yet this area you can have diff different gases to inject into this uh, specimen holder here. Okay. And the next one, I think yeah, that is another is actually controlled by by the software. You can actually click on your gas is into the holder or to the nozzle. So like uh, the gas flow, everything all controlled by the software. Um, and yep. So this one, the whole thing is to highlight that even with the institute experiment, it won't affect the basic specification of your hash of the of this hash of five thousand. Like your lattice, uh, um, the stem resolution is seventy eight picometer. When you do institute with the gas induced, you still can achieve seventy eight picometer. Uh, for the atomic resolution imaging all remain the same because of the lab in gap design and uh, this open window allows user to have the uh, insert different kind of like specimen holders and you can simultaneously uh, observe the stem and SEM and you have the sensitivity extract analysis so that is the how the setup and I think due to time that is the different holder here
I will share with you some of the uh, experiment uh, data here. So this one basically is uh, using the heating uh, specimen holder here. Your sample is actually on top, you place on top of the silicon nitride support film. And there's a heating holder here. So uh, maximum temperature is 1,100 degrees Celsius. So this one is the SEM imaging here. This one is dark field. This one is before the reaction. Before I heat the sample, uh, is the uh, platinum uh, ca carbon catalyst support on the carbon. Want to observe the catalyst deterioration. So these platinum particles here is supported on the carbon. So this one is here on at the uh, um, high vacuum. And after air induced into the chamber, you can see that and heating up to 350 degrees Celsius, you can observe the deterioration of the catalyst itself. The platinum itself is actually kind of like diffused into the carbon support. Uh, when you observe this car, uh, SE imaging that the morphology and you, uh, you it, it, it ended up in the um, porous surface uh, of the carbon support and the platinum disappeared. And if you observe this stem imaging, it's actually all this particle has been diffused into the, the, the catalyst. And uh, this one also, the dark field stem also show that the platinum particles has been coalescent, like uh, kind of like agglomerate together uh, with, uh, during the heating and also the, when the air induced into the, the uh, specimen during the, the reaction. So this is uh, to show that uh, at this different environment, at uh, heating at 150 degrees Celsius and in nitrogen environment, the and even increased to 300 degrees Celsius, the atomic resolution can be achieved. It doesn't uh, affected by the by the gas that you have been induced and also the uh, heat that you induce on your sample. So the next one, yeah, is a quick uh, video. So to show you the, uh, you can capture video. So you, this is stuff you stand. You can see this one, agglomerate. And this one is showing the activities on the surface. And slowly you can see that all oh, this diffuse in, diffuse in into the carbon support itself. And it will disappear in your SE imaging because it's only uh, um, SE imaging collecting the surface morphology. So slowly, slowly it, it disappear here. But you can still can observe in your stem because stem observe the internal structure. It penetrate direct through your sample. So it's very important to have this correlate uh, results for your catalyst observation. It's very, very uh, nice uh, video here to show the movement of the platinum catalyst. Yep. Mm. So this video is actually is a uh, nine minute uh, total, but it's actually kind of like compress that into 56 seconds. Mm. Yeah, we even like the current is actually okay. And I think there are actually more examples here on the correlative, the catalyst particles here. You can see that the platinum here up to 400 degrees Celsius is actually diffused towards the carbon. And you have, it's, it's very, very, very good uh, lab ingot design to, to use view using your own eyes on how the catalyst are uh, affected by the heating and also uh, also the gas environment. It's not only like after that, only you observe the, the, the result that you, you have to kind of like go and uh, like think of like what actually happened during the whole, whole process. And some more example here, but, and this is, yeah, but I think uh, I'd like to come to, this is the real, real limb particles here in the uh, nitrogen and also the high vacuum to show the capability of the, uh, um, atomic resolution. So the conclusion that I will make uh, for this very, very uh, quick introduction of this HFI dozen and in situ capability here is that Hitachi 200 kV fuel emission TEM, TM, STEM and SEM provide atomic resolution imaging and various type of analytical capability uh, in ease of use. And also it combines the technology that enables atomically resolved surface morphology information by SEM which you observe in the video just now, and also the material information, the Z contrast or the phase contrast by the stem, bright field or uh, dark field stem detector with a stable cold field emission source and also the automated aberration correction to observe the atomic uh, resolution as well as very high sensitive EDX analysis. And also with this in-situ option adopted into the system, most of the specifications still remain the same. 
you can achieve the best quality uh, even you have the institute experiment so with the institute uh, uh, capability and the capability of the hash of 5000 itself it provides the real active substance under real reactions a catalyst of activation we call it lab in gap so your lab here is a real lab within the gap yep so uh, i will end my um presentation here and uh thank you so much and welcome with uh uh, questions that it from the floor. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. A.B., for addressing the interesting technical talk on Hitachi HF5000 for in-situ observation using your corrected stem. So, ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen, now uh, we come to the Q&A session. So, uh, the first question is from Ms. Lina Alnani. Thanks, mm -hmm. Dr. A.B., for the interesting technical insights, is it possible to analyze tissue sample cells treated with nanomaterials after it being processed with microtome for TEM by HF5000, TEM, STEM, and SEM? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, this is, uh, yeah, thank you for your questions. Yeah, uh, for the TEM itself, it's actually um, the basic, uh, the capability, it can achieve that. Because uh, for this hash of 5000, sometimes for your sample, if let's say beam sensitive, if 200 kV uh, somehow is too high for your sample, you can mm -hmm. reduce the kV to 80 or 60. So the short answer is yes, can can analyze your sample. Mm. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. AB. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for your answers. So um, there's one more question from Dr. Nor Alia. So, dear, dear Dr. A. B. Su, thank you for your great sharing. Does this SEM version can come with the EDX analysis? Oh, yes, definitely, yes. The EDX analysis is actually either you can have the single detector or the dual detector. But in order to get a very uh, good atomic resolution, we suggest for the double detector here, the dual detector. So, that is one of the results that uh, with the... Um, the atomic resolution uh, EDS mapping. Mm. Yes. Okay. Mm. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ebi. So yes, with that, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Ebi Su, uh, for your fruitful sharing and participations of in this MICNC 20, 2021 uh, technical talk. So mm. now uh, we're going to moving along to our last keynote speaker for MICNC 2021. I am pleased to give a brief introduction of our professor, Dr. Azhar Arifin from University of Malaya. Professor Dr. Azhar Arifin obtained his PhD from University of Nottingham in Asymmetry Organic Synthesis. After graduation in 1999, he returned to Malaysia and joined Chemistry Department. University Malaya working as a young lecturer. In 2003, he was promoted as an associate professor then to a full professor in 2016. So in his research interest is actually mainly focused on the organic synthesis. And currently he has two research projects, which is one is on the synthesis of quinozoline derivative has anti-cancer agents. And the other one will be on the synthesis of carbazole derivative for applications in OLED. So without further ado, I am honored to invite Professor Dr. Azhar Arifin to share his keynote speech on the carbazole based landrimus in organic light emitting diodes OLED applications. The stage is yours, Prof. Dr. Azhar. Please welcome. Okay. Assalamualaikum and good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, first, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see.
Okay, uh, so the title of my talk today is about carbazole based dendrimas in organic light emitting diode uh, application. Uh, as uh, Mr. Chairman told, uh, my name is Azhar Arifin and I'm currently working at the chemistry department faculty of science, University of Malaya. Uh, so what I'm going uh, to share with all of you today is some uh, research that we've been doing uh, for the last uh, 10 years uh, related to this uh, OLED application. So before I go uh, into further detail about my talk, let us uh, look a little bit at the uh, history of what we are using uh, today. So th this is uh, some history about myself as well. Uh, this is my first handful. Uh, that I bought after I finished my PhD in 1999. This handphone was introduced uh, to the market in uh, 2000, if I'm not mistaken. And then this, uh, what we call it in Malaysia, I think they used to make a joke, is uh, Nokia 33 Skupang, ataupun uh, Nokia 3310. Uh, so this uh, first handphone that I own is using LCD display uh, then it was uh, first uh, in the market in 2000 and then now this is my uh, latest handphone that i have uh, which is uh, samsung galaxy note 9 so this handphone uh, using uh, the screen is super amoled uh, display so i'm very sure most of us today is uh, using this kind of smartphone so if you have this smartphone, so I'm sure that you have heard about the word OLED before. Okay, so because the, the, the latest technology in the smartphone are using uh, AMOLED, for example, the Samsung versions of handphone, they're mostly using Super AMOLED for their display. So this is what I'm going uh, to share today, but not going to share the technology of making this uh, OLED display, but I will look at the the very fundamental aspect of the material that is used in uh, making this uh, OLED display. So this uh, OLED research was first uh, come to the uh, attention to the researcher in 1980, uh, 1987 when uh, these two guys, Stephen Wenslai and Ching Wan Tang, published an article in Applied Physics Letters uh, under the title Organic Electroluminescence Diode. So since then, a lot of research has been conducted on this research, but only after 10 years later, uh, which is in 1997, the first OLED display was uh, introduced to the market which, uh, by a company called Pioneer. And then uh, in uh, 2003, if I'm not mistaken, the first digital camera that using OLED display was uh, uh, introduced to the market. So just to a uh, basic introduction for those who did, did not know what is OLED is all about. So OLED stands for Organic Light Emitting Diode. So that is the short form for OLED, uh, the, the full name of OLED, Organic Light Emitting Diode. So from the name, you know that the material that is used to make this is an uh, organic material. It is a thin film display technology that contains an organic material which emit light when current is passed through. And it is mostly used in digital display, for example, your smartphone. And also now it's been used widely as a solid state lighting application. And also, now you can also buy a laptop that using uh, uh, the display is made of uh, an OLED material. In the market today, there are two types of uh, OLED that is available. One of the, the, the OLED that is available, we call it passive metric OLED or well known as PM OLED. So this passive metric OLED is uh, using a simple control scheme in which uh, each row in the display is controlled sequentially and this kind of uh, PM OLED mostly you can find in the device that is 
smaller than 3 inches for example I think nowadays people are wearing this kind of smart uh, watch uh, uh, or health digital on their hands so mostly of the, this, this kind of uh, gadget are uh, using this uh, passive metric OLED technology for the screen and the second type of OLED is called active metric OLED or in short they call it AMOLED so these AMOLED are widely used in a smartphone okay most of our smartphone are using this uh, AMOLED technology if for Samsung, for example, they call it Super AMOLED. Uh, and then uh, this is an example, the schematic diagram, simple schematic diagram, uh, the difference between uh, uh, PM OLED and also AMOLED. So on the uh, left-hand side here is a schematic diagram for the passive metric OLED, how it works. And then on the right-hand side is an example of the active metric OLED for those who want to know in detail. So they can, uh, can, can uh, this is how uh, how your your digital display is uh, made off and how it works. Okay. In general, uh, most of the OLED device have uh, five uh, layers basically. Okay, the most common OLED structure generally consists of five functional layers, which is include hole injection layer. Okay, this ITO is the anode, and then after that we have the this hole injection layer that will carry the positive charge, and then after that we pass to this hole transport layer, and then from hole transport layer the positive charge will pass to this emissive layer EML. And then from the scattered side, which is normally an aluminium, we have the electron injection layer. Okay, this layer is uh, will pass the electron, and then this electron injection layer then pass the electron to electron transport layer, and then from this electron transport layer, this electron will pass to this electron emissive, uh, this emissive layer here. So when this hole and electron mix together at this yellow uh, box here then the light will be emitted so that is how uh, this uh, basic uh, uh, OLED display is uh, working so these all uh, five layers are made of organic material and they are sandwiched between two electrodes usually reducing metal cathode and a transparent oxide anode So how do uh, how do OLED work? So before we look at the OLED, because OLED come after LED, so might as well we just uh, look first at the uh, LED, how LED works. So when you know how LED work, then we can easily understand how OLED work because they, these two LED and OLED are interrelated in uh, each other. So LED are electronic component that are used as small color indicators then this led will produce light okay when photon of light are emitted due to the electron movement in the doppet semiconductor so this is how we get light from the led device whereas the organic led is actually simply a variant of this led in which in the oled the light is emitted by the organic molecule so in the LED, the light is emitted by this dope semiconductor, which is normally uh, metal like a uh, gallium. Okay, and then there is um, many other uh, method that being used at the semiconductor here that will emit light when electron and the hole are mixed together at this position here. So that is for LED. And then for the OLED, we just replace that metal with the organic molecule, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, we have uh, five layers of organic material and each of that five layers have their own roles. So to bring the hole and electron together into this uh, green box here and then it will emit light when everything is in order. Okay, so that is how uh, how OLED work and how it different from the LED. If you look in the market today, Uh, one of the report uh, mentioned that the global OLED market size was valued at US dollar 38.4 billion this year. 
and it is projected to reach US dollar 72.8 billion by the year 2026 and it is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 13.6% during the forecast period. So this is, uh, you can see how big is the market of this OLED business. Okay, for this year alone, is uh, the market value is 38.4 billion and it's predicted to increase to 72.8 billion by the year 2026. So it's a huge uh, business here and also huge a uh, big opportunity for us to do uh, research in this uh, OLED uh, kind of uh, technology. However, there are many challenges in the OLED uh, research in uh, uh, the effort to, to, to produce a good OLED device. One of the many challenges that facing in this OLED uh, research is how to design and synthesis organic molecule that suitable as host material or as any layer in this uh, uh, OLED device because in the OLED device most of the components are made of organic material so one of the many challenges that is facing is how we can design an organic molecule that fulfill uh, the characteristic to be a good material as an OLED because for the molecule to be good uh, OLED, uh, it has to be have triplet exciton confinement because this triplet exciton confinement is the prerequisite for efficient phosphorescent organic light. And then one of the way how to achieve this triplet exciton confinement is by incorporating meso insulating or twisted configuration into the molecular design. So there is some some kind of structure of the organic molecule that we have to make in order to uh, achieve a, a, a characteristic that's suitable for the OLED. And then not only that, the molecule that we synthesize, especially for the host, uh, it should have triplet energy higher than the emitter. So in the OLED device, we have host, we have emitter. So the host must have triplet energy higher than emitter in order to prevent energy back transfer from the phosphorescent gas to the host. And then uh, another criteria is the molecule should have high glass transition temperature, ideally more than 100 degrees Celsius. And then if possible, okay, the molecule should be solution processable. So if solution processable, then we can uh, make a big device. But there are other techniques also available like vacuum deposition, but it depends on, on the uh, capability of the research group if they have the facility for solution process, uh, sorry, the spin coating technique, maybe uh, it, uh, vacuum deposition, maybe they can use a lot of things. But if like us, we don't have that uh, vacuum deposition technique, we rely on the solution processable. So we need the, we have to synthesize the molecule uh, into a big, size then only it can be solution processable so in my research we are focusing on this uh, design and synthesis of the organic molecule that is suitable uh, as a OLED candidate so we choose uh, carbazole as our uh, more, uh, structure or framework uh, in our research so this is the structure of a carbazole so carbazole is actually a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon that contain two six member ring fused to a five member nitrogen containing so you can see here we have two benzene ring and fused into this five member ring of a nitrogen containing uh, five member ring here and then if you look carefully this carbazole is actually half of the framework is come from this indole okay and then this carbazole also is an isoelectronic to this fluorine here. So the difference between carbazole and fluorine is that we replace the CH2 group here. Okay, we have CH2 group here with this NH group here. So this carbazole is actually isoelectronic to this fluorine. Okay, other than carbazole, we can also have this uh, indolo carbazole. Okay, this indolo carbazole, you can have the nitrogen facing opposite to each other or you can have nitrogen facing to each other so these two structure also uh, have a good properties uh, for the uh, making an OLED device okay 
So this is the uh, structure of the carbazole. So this is the basic structure of the carbazole. And then you can make this into the carbazole like this one and this one as well. So why we choose carbazole as the substrate in our study? So one of the reason is carbazole has high triplet energy. So in the OLED, uh, making an OLED device, in order to make it a good material for the OLED, the material should have high triplet energy. Okay, and then how to get the high triplet energy? The molecule should have short conjugation in the molecule. So this is what the carbazole have. If you look at this uh, diagram here, you can see these two aromatic ring here. This uh, high aromaticity. And then these two high aromaticity is uh, separated by this reduced aromaticity of the five member ring nitrogen containing compound. So by having this kind of structure, so we have this uh, property short conjugation. So that is why carbazole uh, has a high triplet energy that is needed for uh, a good OLED molecule. And on top of that, Carbazole also is an excellent hole transporting, uh, has excellent hole transporting uh, material where the HUMO level is around minus 5.0 electron volt. And then this is another property that we can have a torsional angle when you introduce a substituent at position 3 and 6 here. And then this aromaticity of the carbazole gives the stability to the molecule that we synthesize. So this is in terms of the electronic properties of the carbazole, why carbazole are good as a organic molecule as candidate for the, uh, to make an OLED device. In terms of chemical properties, why carbazole is interesting? Uh, because this carbazole, you can do a direct substitution at position three, and six here and you can do indirect substitution at position two and seven in order to get various different kind of structure uh, to make that molecule uh, suitable for uh, OLED device. So for example here you can easily do Friedel-Craft acylation like this one this is just uh, undergraduate chemistry I think most of you who take uh, organic chemistry should know this reaction. You can easily do Friedel-Craft acylation or acylation. Then it will go substitution at position three and six using aluminum trichloride as the Lewis acid. You can also also easily doing this Friedel-Craft alkylation. Okay, you just replace this acid chloride with this tertiary butyl chloride. You can use either <coughs> aluminum trichloride or you can use zinc chloride also in order to introduce this tertiary butyl group on the position three and six. And you can also easily do uh, halogenation at position three and six by using n uh, chlorosuccinamide or n bromosuccinamide or n iodosuccinamide in a solvent DCM, the chloromethane that you can easily introduce halogen at position three and six here, okay? Whereas for substitution at position two and seven, you can also do that, but slightly difficult from uh, position three and six because this is, you have to do indirectly. For example here, okay, you have to start from this uh, meta substituted aniline react with this meta substituted halo benzene here using Ullmann coupling reaction or maybe book work hardwick reaction you get this bisphenyl amine and then this bisphenyl amine you can do oxidative cyclization at these two position here so you will get this two seven substituted uh, carbazole for example here uh, you, if you want to synthesis this 27 difluorocarbazole, you can start with this metafluoroaniline. You react with this metafluorobromobenzene under Ullmann coupling reaction or what how we reaction. You get this bisphenyl amine here, and then in the presence of um, palladium acetate as a catalyst here, you can do oxidative cyclization. 
then you will get this uh, two seven dichlorocarbazole. You can also introduce a different substituent at position two and seven by changing the starting material here. For example, if you use a meta methoxy aniline, you react with this meta bromo and and dimethyl aniline here. Okay, it will form this uh, bisphenyl amine first, and then again you do oxidative cyclization by a catalytic amount of palladium acetate. Then you will get this uh, two seven di substituted carbazole. Okay, why? Why we want to put all these substituents here? Because these substituents have their role in uh, making this molecule as a good candidate for the OLED device. Okay, because by doing this, you can make this uh, carbazole become a good donor. Okay, and then uh, if you attach to a good acceptor, then you can make this molecule become a good candidate for the TADF, what we call it thermally activated delayed fluorescent. So that is one of the thing that you uh, you need to know when you are dealing with this OLED device. And then uh, lastly about the chemical properties of the carbazole is we can easily form a dendrimer like this uh, on the carbazole. Okay, after you do substitution at position 3 and 6 and you do halogenation at position 3 and 6, you can couple these two carbazole here with each other either using uh, Ullmann coupling reaction or you can use bookwork hardwick reaction. So you just need to change the reagent here. If you, use, if you want to use Ullmann coupling reaction, so you just use copper in the presence of copper oxide or sometimes you can use copper iodide uh, but you need high uh, boiling point solvent for example like dichlorobenzene because this reaction require high temperature uh, for the Ullmann reaction then you can get this uh, dendrimer here okay if you want to know a more uh, example of a carbazole based organic compound uh, for the OLED application, you can look in this uh, publication here. It was published in 2017 by Dr. Bridget Wax and Professor Dr. Bilal Kafarani. Okay, so in this review paper, you can see a lot of organic compound contain carbazole moiety that have been used in the study of the OLED. So in this case, particularly referring to the emitters layer and also the TADF uh, uh, properties of the OLED. Okay. So this is just one example of the uh, carbazo that con uh, carb carbazo dendrimus in this uh, OLED study. This uh, molecule was synthesized by Professor Wang. Uh, it was published in 2014. Uh, this molecule actually uh, in 2014, us uh, because at the same time, one of my PhD students also working on this kind of molecules. Uh, but we just uh, lucky that we don't have the tertiary beta group, so we use tertiary penta group, so we get the same molecule but with different substituent at this position. But what I'm trying to say here, this is one example of the carbazole dendrimus that have been uh, proved to be good as an OLED candidate. So our research start from uh, this molecule here when my friend from uh, physics, Dr. Woon Kailin, uh, designed this molecule by computational and he said this molecule uh, probably a good electron transport layer. So then he designed more molecule uh, as shown here. So this is our, our design compound and we have patterned it. Okay, so, so, so due to the time constraint, I will not discuss all this molecule. I will maybe just show one example how we synthesize this compound 2.0 and what is the problem that is facing during uh, synthesis of this molecule here. All these molecules are uh, uh, actually only designed, but at the end, we, we have to synthesize something else due to the problem that we face. So first we look at this compound number two here. 
So this compound number two can be easily synthesized starting from this uh, compound that what we thought initially. So we had this in the lab. So we just try to do nation and then Ulmer coupling reaction. But unfortunately, this reaction didn't work very well. We get multiple products. And then the intended product here, we get only in 5%, which is very, very low in, in the uh, organic synthesis point of view. And then not only that, we also discovered that this compound have solubility issue. So it's not suitable for solution processable. So due to that, we have to modify the structure, how to make this molecule solution processable. So uh, we decide that maybe if we add in alkyl group at the carbazole here like this, then maybe it could solve this solution processable issue. So that's what we did. So we modified our dendrimers. So we synthesize this dendrimer here. So this is the pathway. Those who are interested maybe can look at the slide later on how we synthesis this dendrima in order to overcome the problem of solubility. So after we get the dendrima, then we do Ullmann coupling reaction with various acceptor or various linker here. We have uh, for compound uh, two, we use this uh, one for dibromobenzene. We also have this uh, di sorry, diiodobenzene. So we have this one three diiodobenzene. We also have this kind of diiodo a biphenyl compound here. So we have successfully synthesis four different compound here using the Ullmann coupling reaction uh, by this uh, dendrima. And then we get compound 2.1 here, compound 3.1 here, and then compound 4.1 and compound 5.1. So if you look carefully at the structure here, this compound looks similar to the compound published by Professor uh, Wang uh, in 2014, but we just lucky that we did not use the Shebuta group. Instead, we use the Shepental group. So that is the difference between our compound and their compound. And then uh, my PhD student have managed to get uh, one gram of this compound. Then we fabricate to make a device. And then we show that some properties as an OLED. And then we published this uh, finding in Journal of Luminescence in 2017. So this is the main issue with the OLED. We want to make sure that the molecule still have high triplet energy. So we make a comparison. So if we have this molecule, we can see that the triplet energy is around 2.79 electron volt. If we have more, uh, longer uh, bridge like this, this uh, biphenyl here. So you can see that the triplet energy drop a little bit to 2.65. So meaning that this is not good. If we have something to block the rotation here, like introducing this meta group here, then uh, we see that the triplet energy is maintained uh, at high level, not much different uh, from the triplet energy of the carbazole. So that's why this molecule are good. And then if we have this kind of structure, you can see also the triplet energy is maintained, okay, similar to this one. So this is the whole idea why carbazole is good in this uh, OLED study, because we can functionalize the carbazole at the same time we maintain the molecule uh, at high level of triplet energy, because in the OLED study, uh, one of the good criteria or one of the important criteria is to have the molecule at high triple energy. This is in order to get a blue light okay, from the from the OLED device. And then other than that, we also have successfully synthesized this compound, just that we don't have enough amount to do device for this molecule to study their behavior as a OLED device. This molecule also have uh, quite good triplet energy, uh, 2.72 electron volt, which is uh, maybe suitable as electron transport layer or maybe suitable as the host layer in the OLED device. So I think maybe I'm running out of time. So I just would like to acknowledge a few people. I don't know why my slide suddenly become like this. Uh, 
to the KTU where I'm I'm now now I'm at the moment I'm in Lithuania at KTU Technology University under Horizon Mega 2020 segment and also I would like to thank University Malaya for various grant that I received and also the Ministry of Higher Education for the FRGS grant Ministry of Science for the Science Fund and also what company that initially sponsored us for to start this on that study Thank you for your attention. So if you have any question, you can. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Dr. Zaha, for addressing the interesting keynote speech on carbosyl based dendrimers in OLED applications. So ladies and gentlemen, now we come to a Q&A session. I will read the question from the Q&A banner. So the first question is from our Dr. Nor Alia. Assalamualaikum Prof Azha thank you for your great sharing may we get opinion on the production cost of OLED since it has been reported to be rather higher than LED okay thank you for the question uh, I'm not in the business line uh, to, uh, to give an accurate answer so the answer is yes uh, and no it depends on which aspect that you look. If you look at the big screen of OLED, yes, the production cost is still high. But if you look at the small size like our handphone here, so we have been using this. Is it expensive? So I think uh, even the student can afford to buy the uh, smartphones. You no, know? so meaning that for the small size like the handphone, the cost is not that expensive. But for big screen light OLED, uh, LG, uh, they have LG OLED TV now, that one is maybe expensive and also the reliability is still not there if we were to compare with LED, yeah, that, that, uh, that, that is true. In certain aspect, LED is still uh, better than the OLED, but if you look at the small size of the device, yeah, uh, OLED is better in certain aspect. So there is pro and con. And that is why research in OLED is still ongoing. Many people still doing research. If you look in the publication from China, from uh, Korea, from Japan, there is a lot of research still ongoing because uh, we, we still try to get a big screen uh, OLED with a uh, cheaper, but at the moment still not there. And also the reliability is still not there for big screen, but for small, uh screen like handphone i think there should not be any problem because everybody is using the oled device now uh in their hand now i hope i answered the question okay thank you prof for your answer now we're moving towards to the next question so the next question is from dr tan good day prof azha OLED has excellent viewing experience, but he has a shorter lifespan than LED, right? Yes, the answer is right. Um, for big screen, uh, for small screen, I'm not very sure. Uh, because I've been using my smartphone since 2018 and until now it's still working but yeah to, I, I cannot give you the the exact answer but i just based on my experience yes the answer is uh right led is still better for big screen uh but small screen i think led and oled i think uh, they are comparable uh, at the moment that is my 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 answer thank you prof we have a next question for you from me, madam shabila sazali Assalamualaikum Prof, such an interesting presentation. My I know, does molecular weight of the compounds give effects on its efficiency? Okay, uh, actually the molecular weight does not give uh, much effect on the efficiency but the design is important. So one of the reasons that I chose Cabazol because uh, uh, from my understanding, I'm not actually a physicist, I'm a synthetic organic chemist, but I try to understand the, the basic concept that is required in this OLED, OLED, OLED business. The, one of the criteria is uh, what I understand, we need the molecule to have high triplet energy. So the main concern is whether the molecule can have high triplet energy or not. So either the molecule small or big, that one does not affect 
the efficiency of the device the purity of the compound is the main uh, the, the other important thing so the design of the structure <coughs> and the purity of the compound when we make the device is the important that this the thing that will affect uh, the efficiency of the device but the size of the molecule not because in our case our molecule size is 1500 gram per mole that is the smallest that we have we also have molecule size of 2000 gram per mole so this is what if we're talking about uh not a polymer because uh, i think maybe in the market now maybe they use polymer i'm not sure because this uh, samsung or this uh, digital company they keep secret so we don't know what is actually that molecule that they use but they use organic molecule but we don't know i don't know whether they use a polymer kind of organic molecule or they use a small molecule but uh, to answer that question in my opinion the the size of the molecule uh, will not affect the efficiency but the design of the molecule will affect whether the molecule have high triple energy or low triple energy that's from my my understanding as a synthetic chemist thank you prof thank you for, for the answer now we have a last question uh, from uh, Mr. Iman. Thanks, Prof, for the interesting topic. Regarding to the OLED, they have some toxicity to a people's and maybe environment. Can you explain a bit about the toxicity from it by comparing with LED perspective? Okay. Now is we are talking about organic molecule versus heavy metal. Okay, in the first place when we OLED was introduced, they are using heavy metal like iridium for the emitter layer. So, and then slowly we replace the iridium with the organic material because iridium is heavy metal, it's difficult to get and then the cost is very high and it also toxic. So LED, from my understanding for the, 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 the semiconductor, the dopot semiconductor, they, they are using metal. For example, gallium, but I don't know, gallium is it toxic or not? But uh, to be honest, all organic molecule, all chemical, we can call it toxic, but it depends on which aspect that you, you look at it. So if you're dealing with chemical, you cannot avoid from uh, having uh, this uh, toxic thing. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the molecule that we make ourselves in the lab, Cabazo, for example, Cabazo is not toxic at all. It's a nice yellowish powder you can play in the round. We have a kilogram of that Cabazo in our lab. But when we make it into device, I'm not sure because we have uh, we have electrode which is made of metal like aluminium. So aluminium, you want to talk about toxic, aluminium is also toxic. So in the LED, they have a lot of metal inside there, so which is also toxic. So I cannot give easy answer here. I think both have their pro and con in terms of the toxicity, toxicity effect. So that is the, the honest answer that I can, I can offer. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you for the answer. Uh, thank you so much for your significant sharing of today's speech. So uh, now we are... Uh, reach at the end of this session thank you all for your participations and on behalf of the micnc 2021 organizing committee i would like to seek for your kind cooperation to fill up the feedback form in the chat box also you are invited to join the rest of the event after the lunch break please join us again at 2 p.m for more interactive parallel sessions by our speakers Hope to see you again. Thank you very much for your time and support. Thank you all.